I used to have a fun, conversational gimmick I would deploy every time the subject of science fiction came up at parties or amongst friends. There are only two fundamental categories of science fiction, I would boast. It all boils down to this. A science fiction story is either Star Trek or Neuromancer. What I meant, fundamentally, I would go on to explain, was that since science fiction deals first and foremost with technology, the first obvious thematic element you will notice from any book, movie, or TV show operating in this genre is whether it is technologically optimistic, a la Star Trek, or technologically pessimistic, a la Neuromancer, or the cyberpunk subgenre it gave rise to. In other words, the first question any work of science fiction has to answer is this. Is mankind ultimately destined to be liberated by our reason and technology? or enslaved to it. I stopped confidently presenting this binary when, on one occasion, someone responded to my assertion with the question, okay, so what's Dune? I was stumped. While I would never call Dune an optimistic piece of fiction, I could neither comfortably categorize it as nihilistic, though its vision of humanity's future is certainly grim and austere, it is in no way squalid or shoddy in the way that classical cyberpunk settings function. The setting isn't some junkyard or the scrap heap of a megalopolis. Instead, the setting and tone of Dune is regal, noble, sweeping, and magisterial. The Imperium of Polytrades is awe-inspiring, but this awe isn't enabled by any of the scientific or technological optimism in the story. In fact, not only is science and tech not foregrounded, it's barely ever mentioned or described. Dune? Uh, I stumbled. Dune is, well, Islamic, I guess? Lucky for me, my cheap party trick was done away with just as I was starting to become more interested in politics. And while optimism versus pessimism towards humanity's entanglements with technology and our eventual fate may have become too narrow as categories, I nonetheless continued to weigh and measure works of science fiction and fantasy. Now with the broader scales of ideologically and aesthetically left-wing or ideologically and aesthetically right-wing. But is it fair or necessary to reduce works of fiction to something so binary? Does every writer of speculative fiction, along with the imaginary worlds they create, necessarily have to pick a side? Is a work of science fiction or fantasy ever either innately and essentially left-wing or right-wing? Is it not too simplistic or low fidelity to characterize the features of fictional worlds as always existing between left and right? And at the very least, doesn't this risk sucking out all the fun? These questions imply that this is my subjective experience of speculative fiction, a critical tool that I'm bringing to the table, like a surgeon with their scalpel, and one I can decide to set aside or disregard, when in fact I think that this dichotomy is just simply an objective, observable dialectic within the genre. While George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire presents a fully realized world unto itself, it's simultaneously the author's extended critique of and reaction against the romanticism and sentimentality of J. R. R. Tolkien. While Martin obviously holds Tolkien in high esteem, Martin's work is clearly a dialogue between himself and Tolkien, where Tolkien creates clear, black and white dichotomies between good and evil, Martin works within the gray. His characters grapple with the real politic of a medieval world and its Machiavellian struggle for power. If we look at recent sci-fi series like The Expanse, we can observe both the influence of Star Trek as well as a skepticism towards Star Trek's vision of mankind's future. Star Trek presents a humanity that has overcome its political differences and established a unified, globalist government. It's this unity that allows Starfleet to begin to explore the galaxy. The Expanse, in contrast, shows a humanity still fraught with division and schism, despite having colonized Mars and half the moons in our solar system. I'm conscious of the fact that I may sound like I'm contradicting myself here. 
In an earlier video, I have stated that, quote, a work of art is doomed the moment it prioritizes politics over aesthetics. And I want to make it clear here that this is not what I'm accusing any of these writers of, even those with whom I disagree with politically. When it comes to film and television, it's certainly true executive producers and the Hollywood system may have a heavy hand in steering the ideological messaging of an intellectual property, but I don't believe any solitary writer consciously commits themselves to the grueling challenge of writing a novel in order to correct the politics of their predecessors. Unless, of course, they're a total hack. A new work of fiction is always a simultaneous love letter and a critique an expression of its author's influences and their anxieties over those influences. When comparing an author's work to that of their predecessors, their instinctual, subconscious aesthetic decisions they make will fundamentally boil down to whether the creator exists to the right or to the left of their idols. This becomes obvious when we look at what sort of personalities are drawn to different sci-fi and fantasy stories. In my last video, I made mention of a few commonly made juxtapositions within science fiction and fantasy genres. Namely, the recurring comparisons and contrasts between Dune and Star Wars, as well as Star Trek and the Warhammer 40k universe. Whether someone prefers Dune or Star Wars will likely come down to whether someone prefers restoration or revolution. Throughout Dune, Paul Atreides, is in the process of establishing a hierarchy and forming an imperium. He is seeking absolute power. These are, fundamentally, right-wing goals. Readers of Dune, or at least deep readers that look past the superficial adventure story, are likely to sympathize with Paul's ruthless attitude towards power and politics. Luke Skywalker, by contrast, is a revolutionary. Throughout Star Wars, he's trying to overturn and break free from hierarchies, and views absolute power as something which he needs to resist and disavow. These are all, transparently, left-wing sensibilities. This story is all too familiar and pervasive, as it is the story that all left-leaning people like to tell about themselves, regardless of the amount of real-world power they accumulate. The contrasts that become apparent between Star Trek and Warhammer, on the other hand, are far more transparent and, strange to say this about science fiction, ancient. Even though both worlds depict humanity's far distant futures, I always found these settings to evoke humanity's past. In particular, these two settings have always illustrated for me one of the oldest schisms within the Western world. The schism between Protestantism and Catholicism, a split which, in many respects, birthed the distinctions between left and right in the West. Star Trek, particularly Star Trek The Next Generation, is a progressive's utopian vision for the future and, in its essence, Protestant. Protestantism is what would eventually give rise to the Enlightenment, to capitalism, and to the Industrial Revolution. Many would argue that we can draw a straight line from Protestantism to the hypermodern, progressive world where we find ourselves today. This may be a bit reductive, and I certainly don't mean to assign the blame for progressivism entirely on Protestants. However, many Protestants and Catholics would agree that progressivism is a form of Christian heresy, that it maintains certain Christian features while discarding other fundamental features, and surely the Protestant Reformation is the Ur example, the most seismic breaking away from past doctrines to ever occur within Christendom. Many people have traced this social genealogy, most famously Max Weber in his book the Protestant Work Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and more recently by Menchus Moldbug in An Open Letter to an Open-Minded Progressive. As Protestantism continued to divide and subdivide between different sects, newer denominations and branches gradually became less and less tied to dogma, and alongside this, more and more denuded of any metaphysics or theological claims. This loosening of theological certainties eventually evolved into scientism, and the technocratic faith in secular rationality that is, today, hegemonic. Secular rationality, seen in this light, isn't so much a wholesale rejection of theological and religious thinking, so much as it is a particular evolutionary branch of Christendom. It's simply done away with any notion of God. I don't mean to offend any of my Protestant viewers. 
I know plenty of Protestants who take their faith and religion very seriously and are just as dissatisfied with the modern world as any Orthodox priest. But this genealogical lens is, to say the least, interesting, if not the whole story. So what does any of this have to do with Star Trek? Well, Star Trek presents a highly idealized, utopian vision of a rationalist world. While rationalism shed itself of any claims to faith and revelation long ago, it has kept Protestantism's self-assuredness, its sense of manifest destiny. The problem of evil, as it is presented in Star Trek, is simply a problem of ignorance. To proclaim something as, quote, evil would produce a brief nose laugh from any member of Starfleet. Evil is recognized by crew members of the Starship Enterprise as an anachronism. Evil is simply lacking enough information. If something presents itself as evil, it in reality simply needs to be fully thought through. If an alien race is hostile and warlike, they simply need a steadier diet of secular, rationalist government. If a black hole is about to swallow an entire star system, Starfleet simply needs more science. Knowledge, enlightenment values, and rationality lead to liberation. And with liberation, we of course have our left-wing sentiment. Contrast this with Warhammer 40k where evil, in the form of chaos, blooms eternal. Most people who watch Star Trek won't make any immediate inference to Protestantism, but with Warhammer 40,000, Catholicism saturates every aspect of the world. It is unmistakably its inspiration. The Imperium is, essentially, Dark Ages Christianity in outer space. The Space Marines are the Knights Templar, the Crusaders. The power structures are all unmistakably medieval. If that weren't enough evidence, nearly everything referred to in the Imperium is in Latin. And despite being the year 40,000, mankind is still depicted battling unmistakably, perhaps cartoonishly, evil, horned, red-skinned demons. A foe which is in some sense eternal, undefeatable, and inescapable, as the demonic is intrinsic to man's own soul and his fallen state. No amount of technology, and the Warhammer world has just as many spaceships and warp drives and lasers as Star Trek, has helped mankind to transcend human limitations, or allowed us to set aside evil as a tangible concept and force at work in the universe. As opposed to liberation, Warhammer is a world that depicts submission to the God Emperor and to one's duty. It's basically a reactionary power fantasy in a traditionalist Disneyland. We can see in Warhammer the vestiges of right-wing, conservative, and reactionary sensibilities and how they were grounded in early pre-Reformation Christianity. Mankind is not flying higher and higher into the stars, as Star Trek would have us believe, but perpetually and eternally falling into darkness, but for the grace of the God Emperor. I'd note as well that the contrasting aesthetics of Star Trek and Warhammer are what fully bring forth this Protestant and Catholic distinction. The characters of Star Trek have always seemed wooden and androgynous, at least beginning with Star Trek The Next Generation. Leave aside for a moment the Chad swagger of Captain James T. Kirk. Think of the settings, the beige, unadorned deck of the Enterprise, always felt sterile and astringent. It reminds me of the austerity I felt, sorry again Protestants, when I visited a lot of Protestant churches. In countries that turned Protestant, there was an accompanying turn to austerity in their architecture, a turn towards a minimalism and utilitarianism, to environments that are not seeking to impress or excite anyone. The visuals of Warhammer, on the other hand, have a Catholic grandeur to them. Its illustrations are Roman, overwhelmingly detailed and ostentatious. From the very beginning, Games Workshop commissioned oil paintings to help flesh out their setting. Some tableaus are so ornate and evocative, they look like they are part of the Sistine Chapel. The Gothic artwork of Warhammer puts one in mind of woodprints by Albrecht Dürer, or masterpieces by Hieronymus Bosch. Skulls and gargoyles are incorporated into nearly every image. Death and struggle is always foregrounded. The Warhammer world was developed initially through static, two-dimensional imagery, whereas Star Trek is a full-motion television series filled with live actors. And yet, despite this, for me, the visual elements of Warhammer always depicted a greater sense of vitality, of movement, 
of being alive compared to the sterile sets and camera angles of Star Trek. Rather than the androgynous unisex spandex of Starfleet, the physicality of the space marines is larger than life. Hypermasculine, part Greek statue and part roided out pro wrestler. There's something so incredibly excessive about the aesthetics of Warhammer, whereas there is nothing superfluous or ostentatious about the aesthetics of Star Trek. It's almost as if the ideology of Warhammer predates the printing press or mass literacy. They have to inspire and convert you by entering your mind through your senses. Warhammer 40,000 is still trying to evoke a sense of awe and fear, of one's smallness when confronted with the universe. It is, simultaneously and paradoxically, far more dystopian than Star Trek, and yet far more inspirational. Evil does exist, and it falls to humanity to face it and struggle with it, eternally if need be, as opposed to rationalizing with it. This may present a universe that is far more horrifying, but it also presents you with the opportunities for self-overcoming. Evil may be both eternal and undeniable, but so, too, is the figure of the hero who faces it, of the knight errant, of one's ego ideal. Star Trek, on the other hand, finds your concept of evil, as well as your own narcissism present in the concept of the heroic, to be deeply problematic. Data will try to remember to email you a Slate Star Codex article later, along with several peer-reviewed studies, as soon as he gets in front of a laptop. But let's now examine what's perhaps the most obvious, most ubiquitous dichotomy of all within science fiction and fantasy. Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. Well, the internet has certainly had its heyday with this comparison. There have been rap battles between Harry and Frodo, and countless defenses and apologetics for one set of books over the other. But if it is true that these dichotomies always form naturally out of some innate sense of left and right, what aspects of left-wing ideology and right-wing ideology does juxtaposing Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter bring forth? We need hardly spend any amount of time arguing which series is right and which is left. J.R.R. Tolkien was a devout Catholic and his work is inspired from both pagan and Christian history and myth. J.K. Rowling, on the other hand, is a card-carrying liberal progressive. She would still define herself as such despite the recent heresy, excommunication, and inquisition she suffered having been labeled a TERF, what amounts to a modern-day witch by trans activists for her milquetoast statements regarding what defines womanhood. While there are many fundamental differences that we could examine, I'm particularly partial to the aspects the YouTuber The Golden One articulated in his video titled Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Slave Morality, and Self-Improvement. According to The Golden One, there are basically two kinds of guys, those who prefer Lord of the Rings, like himself, and those who prefer Harry Potter. Master morality and slave morality are concepts that the Golden One is borrowing from Nietzsche, but he offers us a brief definition. Slave morality is the modern morality we have in the West. The more downtrodden you are, the more good you are. Weak is good, poor is good, infirm is good. Poor health and victimhood and being in the minority are all good. By contrast, beauty is bad, strong is bad, wealthy is bad, Popularity is bad. Being in the majority is bad. If we look at the character Harry Potter from the perspective of slave morality, he is granted the status of hero because he has the moral advantage of being as downtrodden as he can be. An orphan, he lives with his cruel aunt and uncle in a crawl space under a stairwell. While being utterly materially disadvantaged in his life, he is seen as having the moral advantage for any devotee of slave morality. Unsurprisingly, the Golden One, a professional bodybuilder and real-life Thor, views the Lord of the Rings as the superior work, as it champions master morality, the true morality, the true good, a sense of responsibility over one's fate and self-improvement. The Golden One points out that slave morality is also quite common in Hollywood films, Think of your standard high school drama in which the weak nerdy guy is the good guy and the athletic jock is the bad guy. Whereas in reality, the opposite is often true. The jock is most often a nice guy, someone who looks out for their community and is well respected by others. 
A weak guy is resentful and maladjusted. Slave morality is also always front and center in superhero films, where an average Joe is suddenly granted superpowers. Sudden, unearned superpowers are granted to Harry in the form of his invitation to Hogwarts, whereas Frodo and Sam, the heroes of Lord of the Rings, are never given any unearned advantage. And yet, they pursue their goals, despite this and despite overwhelming odds, relying on loyalty, friendship, and love of their homeland instead. The Golden One concludes that Lord of the Rings is superior from a philosophical and moral perspective because it illustrates how anyone can become a hero if they simply commit to heroic ideals. Harry Potter is not someone who pursues actions based on moral principles. Rather, he is, quote, someone special, a chosen one. While Harry Potter is a work of fantasy and the story will unfold at the unreal, unearthly campus of Hogwarts, the most unreal, unearthly, and fantastical premise of the series is the idea that Harry is granted strength while never having to pursue his own self-improvement, never having to relinquish his slave morality. Instead of adopting a life-affirming attitude and pursuing self-improvement despite his terrible circumstances, Harry simply remained downtrodden and hoped for a miracle to come and save him. I'll admit to being a Lord of the Rings man myself and never having read the Harry Potter books. They came out once I was well past my childhood and exiting my adolescence, but I do remember always feeling that there was something uncanny about their popularity. While I was growing up, reading Lord of the Rings, or most any fantasy fiction really, was still a niche, specialty hobby, and the domain of self-proclaimed nerds. Harry Potter seemed to be an early instance, perhaps the earliest, of quote, nerd culture spilling into the mainstream. Well before the later avalanche of Marvel adaptations and the mainstreaming of comic culture. People who would never have been caught dead with a copy of The Hobbit or Wizard of Earthsea or Ender's Game, I would nonetheless witness hungrily consume all of the Harry Potter books. Kids who were socially successful and well-liked managed to remain so, despite having autistically memorized all of the facts about Rowling's universe. Why was this the case? Why did slavish fandom to Harry Potter carry so little stigma compared to other works of fantasy literature? Revisiting the Golden Ones video put me in mind of an essay by A.S. Byatt I had read in the New York Times when it appeared all the way back in 2003, titled, Harry Potter and the Childish Adult. It's been almost 20 years since its publication, but I still think that Byatt offers the most thoroughgoing and satisfying explanation as to why the popularity of Harry Potter was able to transcend the typical, limited audience for fantasy fiction. Here I quote from the essay. Tolkien wrote about the skills of inventing secondary worlds. Ms. Rowling's world is a secondary, secondary world, made up of intelligently patchworked derivative motifs from all sorts of children's literature. The important thing about this particular secondary world is that it is symbiotic with the real, modern world. Magic, in myth and fairy tales, is about contacts with the inhuman, trees and creatures, unseen forces. Most fairy story writers hate and fear machines. Miss Rowling's wizards shun them and use magic instead, but their world is a caricature of the real world and has trains, hospitals, newspapers, and competitive sport. Much of the real evil in the later books is caused by newspaper gossip columnists who make Harry into a dubious celebrity, which is the modern word for the chosen hero. Most of the rest of the evil, apart from Voldemort, is caused by bureaucratic interference in educational affairs. Ms. Rowling's magic world has no place for the numinous. It is written for people whose imaginative lives are confined to TV cartoons and the exaggerated, more exciting, not threatening, mirror worlds of soaps, reality TV, and celebrity gossip. Its values and everything in it are, as Gatsby said of his own world when the light had gone out of his dream, quote, only personal. Nobody is trying to save or destroy anything beyond Harry Potter and his friends and family, end quote. Wyatt goes on to criticize Harry Potter through Freud's concept of 
The Family Romance, a fantasy scenario in which children, typically between ages 7 and adolescence, imagine that their family is not their real family, and invent a fantasy in which they are secretly a prince or a princess, or a changeling of some sort, from a different world and destined for greatness. This clearly maps on to the opening pages of most every Harry Potter novel, but plenty of fantasy and children's literature begins with this narrative device, with ordinary children being suddenly transported into an extraordinary world. But Byatt points out, quote, In the case of the great children's writers of the recent past, there was a compensating seriousness. There was, and is, a real sense of mystery, powerful forces, dangerous creatures in dark forests. Reading writers like these, we feel we are being put back in touch with earlier parts of our culture, when supernatural and inhuman creatures, from whom we thought we learned our sense of good and evil, inhabited a world we did not feel we controlled. If we regress, we regress to a lost sense of significance we mourn for. Miss Rowling's magic world has nothing in common with these lost worlds. It is small, and on the school grounds, and dangerous only because she says it is. In this regard, it is magic for our time. Miss Rowling, I think, speaks to an adult generation that hasn't known and doesn't care about mystery. They are inhabitants of urban jungles, not of the real wild. They don't have the skills to tell airsats magic from the real thing. For, as children, they daily invested the airsats with what imagination they had." End quote. I'm in pretty much absolute agreement with Byatt in her essay. What I personally always loved about Lord of the Rings or the Chronicles of Narnia was that I felt they were a window onto an ancient past. In addition to loving fantasy literature, I was always obsessed with medieval Europe and the Christian and pre-Christian Western history from which these books drew their inspiration. Harry Potter always struck me as creating more of a chasm between the ancient and the modern, rather than a bridge. It's not as if your average, middle-brow Harry Potter reader was going to move on to reading Beowulf in their free time. This satisfactorily answers for me as well the nagging question as to why kids never appeared to forego any of their status or their perceived normalcy and mundanity in reading and enjoying Harry Potter. Harry Potter fandom could never be confused with some fascination or reverence for the pre-modern West. That was for those weird kids who played Magic the Gathering in the cafeteria. But still, in drafting this essay, I do feel a certain sense of guilt dogpiling on Harry Potter. Are the books really that bad or corrosive? The rise of Harry Potter began right at the turn of the century, alongside the rise of cell phones and social media. It caused millions of kids to read thousands of pages, kids who may have otherwise never cracked open a single book, who may have squandered those hours staring at screens. It helped ensure that a generation of children would still consider themselves to be readers, at a time when reading was under siege and never had greater competition from technology. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis weren't about to accomplish this, and who knows? Maybe a lot of people went on to read more classic works of fantasy and children's literature once they finished Harry Potter. I'm sure it converted some subset of people into deeper, heavier readers of fantasy literature. While I never read any of the Potter books from start to finish, there was one time where I found myself in an airport lounge with my flight delayed, having accidentally left my book back at my hotel. I decided to step into the airport bookstore and pick up a mass market paperback of Harry Potter. And I have to say, the time flew by. My plane was delayed by a couple hours and it wasn't a short flight on top of that. Well, I found the setting to lack what I look for in fantasy. At a sentence by sentence level, the writing was crisp, the structure was sound, the story was fluid, the narratives and the characters were somehow addicting. No less a luminary than Roger Scruton famously defended Rowling as a storyteller, even though he would express qualms similar to A.S. Byatt regarding her as more of a modernist than a children's fantasy writer in any classical sense. I certainly can't accuse Rowling of being a bad writer, on a technical level, as can be easily said of writers like Suzanne Collins or Stephanie Meyer. Despite the fact that it lacks many of the qualities of classic works of fantasy fiction, I, I do think Harry Potter has, in aggregate, most likely been a source for good in the world, if not a source for the true and the beautiful. But none of this can be said, however, in defense of 
Lev Grossman's The Magicians, and I feel no such guilt over anything I am about to say.